Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. My name is Edward Madajemu. I am a animator and concept artist specialized particularly in making VR animation pipelines using VR tools, primarily Quill and things like Gravity Sketch, uh, among others. And I do a lot of illustration. I also do a lot of game dev. So I'm always trying to I'm always trying to experiment in, in that like line of how do I use VR to make like animation, games, films, and just back and forth and exploring all the new, like just trying out things that people haven't necessarily delved into too much to kind of find the, mo more, the most efficient ways of kind of creating handcrafted 3D animation. And yeah, that's mostly my practice. I do a lot of these where I paint something and I put it in a little box. I'm a huge fan of comics, which is where this is coming from. And today I'm just going to be sharing my Quill and Unity workflow. It's something I've been developing for a couple of years now. I I work at a research lab where I'm where I'm basically allowed to just kind of mess around with the stuff all day. So this is this is kind of years of of research coming together to figure out how to do all this stuff. But yeah, it's a workflow. I'm hoping I'm hoping that people will adopt as, as soon as it gets like the more the, the, over time. Because I think it's it's a really fast and efficient one and allows you to do a bunch of high fidelity stuff using using Quill in a relatively short amount of time. Okay, so I'm just going to start with this picture. This is, I, I painted this specifically for today's stream. And yeah, it's a lot more shit of you like this. So this is kind of the general image I was making. And as you can see, this is kind of unlike what I usually do, because like there's there's no color, there's no like lighting in, in here at all because that's all going to be added in Unity. It's just all flat colors and flat shapes. But I'm, I'm going to break down what's in this scene and and kind of why everything's is built the way it is. So first, I'm going to just show you what the geometry is like. I think that's really important to, to stress because okay, I'm going to take off this. Sorry, I'm going to take off the frame just for simplicity's sake. So yeah, that's the skybox. I did flatten it into into a 360 image just yet, but it's still just all mesh outskirts of the whole thing. And you can see the trees are, and and this is actually goes for most of the uh, the mesh in the scenes that the trees and like the trees are and the, the most of the geometry is actually made of just singular flat like uh, singular round strokes like this. There's not the line brush, there. right? Yeah. Line tool. Yeah. It's not like I, I try to I try to refrain from using basically any of the flat the ribbon flat strokes for anything that's not like for like more structural geometry. You don't want to use it for that because it's it's single sided, so it's not gonna take in light properly. So I tend to use I tend it's it's more of a similar to this where you would just use this to kind of create what the actual underlying surface geometry is and then you'd use this smaller ribbon tool just to like get your details on top of it. So do you um, generally use the sphere brush the most or for this uh, kind of stuff or more like the squashed brush? Uh, it, it, it depends on what I'm doing. If I'm making, when I'm, when I'm just kind of doing general hard, hard surface structures, I, I, I use a sphere brush a lot, but I also like to, I really love using this cause it's like, there's a, there's just a nice kind of brushy texture. I like that comes with it when you use yeah. this more and then I, I tend to optimize a lot of things but it depends on on the character for example everything is optimized except the character right now because mm -hmm. characters i've noticed are really hard to light in ways that that look like good across the board so hmm. she's actually not optimized like at all there's very little on her that's optimized we can see this is actually just the stock like the kind of like the primitive shape this is basically just this and what I One did, short line brush stroke. Exactly. And all I did was I just kind of adjust the thickness. And until I got to like a shape that I liked and I just nudged and moved the face outwards. And a big part of this like is, is, is just like style. Like your style will indicate how much these techniques like can work for you. Because I, I'm using a fairly like a very stylized way of working where my my the face details are all kind of simulated but using line art and just brush strokes kind of like I, I think that's a kind of common technique at this point is but they're less modeled they're more they're more illustrated on top of and so let me turn off the geometry 
Yeah, so that's kind of the loop here because the important thing here is getting clean, like clean mesh and clean normals. Otherwise, you're not going to get the best lighting. It's not to say that you can't with this workflow, you can't like get more painterly effects. I know some of my things are more painterly, but if you want, if you want precise lighting control, you're going to want cleaner normals. So I would recommend this sense, using yeah. this for cold theater because mm -hmm. <laughs> this will not run. I can promise you that. Well, the thing is that, you know, if I look at your wireframe, it still looks fairly clean, you know, because you use like um, the nine strokes. I think it's still, you know, like it's it's not like the lathe technique, you know, where you have like yeah. tons of spaghetti strokes, you know, <laughs> it's like it's fairly clean, you know, like it's it's good. And, and Daniel, you said something, but Daniel, you're very quiet. So you might want to. Can you hear me now? Oh, much better. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, no, I was gonna say the the line work. Um, I, I I have the same kind of technique or similar, where I, I use line work to suggest detail that it's that it's not there with the geometry, and uh, you know that line work is sometimes it's crucial to really kind of really sell the model, sell the details. I really love the way you use it. Uh, it uh, it's really really cool. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's honestly like a. I don't think even not in for all workflows. I think especially with Quill, it's, it's kind of like a fundamental thing, just implying detail with line work. Yeah, you can yeah. you can get away with not actually having too much going on in your models. I found. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just to break down the layers, so this was kind of my initial. I just did this really quickly in Photoshop to use as reference. I ha I have like. This was just to kind of get an idea of what the feel for the scene was. And so I'll just leave that there. And then I started by making, so before I got the environment or anything in, I just made, I made this little doodle to get an idea of what the set was. And I don't really have to worry. The beauty of, of working this way is I don't really have to worry about a lot of things. For example, like you have like, there's degrees of fog and there's all these smaller details that I don't have to like block in here. I can still figure them out later as I'm working. So after I got that done, I did the environment. First things first. And it's made up of different, like the important thing here is it's not, it's still, this is still kind of like a planned composition. Just because you have lighting doesn't mean you shouldn't have an idea of where your lighting is gonna be. That's why I painted this first before I, before I went into this. Cause I found you get the best effects when you blend painting with dynamic lighting, not necessarily just letting the lighting carry over everything. So what I'm so what I did here is you can see these strokes here. You don't find them on the rest of the of the trees. You only find them on these two because they're closest to, to the screen. But these strokes here, which and I can show you on this main tree, yeah, separated are like separated into three different layers. So there's the fill. That's the actual structural mm -hmm. geometry. This is basically what Unity is going to use to get lighting. This is where most of your lighting is going to be calculated on. This mm -hmm. the fill layer that I'm turning on, on and off here. And I have a question, though. What? I have a question. Uh, do you intentionally avoid drawing shadows uh, on this uh, on, on Quill because you know later the shadows are going to be calculated later, yeah. So you're in in this version. You you purposely avoid. I mean, like drop shadows or any yes. type of uh, lighting. Yes, to a certain degree. So like sometimes, mm -hmm. like it depends on what I'm like my what I'm actually doing with the painting. Like in other in other paintings, I like sometimes I just actually straight up paint the entire scene exactly as I want it in Quill, and then mm -hmm. I light add light on top of it. The caveat mm -hmm. is that basically once you paint. A clear defined source of lighting it's mm. much harder to change your mind when you when you go into unity and overlay lighting on top of it you're kind of stuck to what yeah. you do and that can work really nicely in, in in a lot of cases i actually do that for most of my work but in like whenever i know i want to reuse a scene multiple times like for example on my grad film i'm working my grad film is pretty much set in, entirely in one room and i know i'm going to have different lighting variations <laughs> so instead of painting mm -hmm. a very hard light source I kind of try to paint an ambient occlusion. I did some of it here. I didn't have, I didn't, have, I didn't do enough of it. I, I was gonna do more, but just just for time. But you, you're more, you're essentially painting ambient occlusion more than anything else because mm. basically the the workflow I have doesn't like. You can have dynamic ambient occlusion in things like Unity, but it often looks best when you paint it in because like you don't you don't want to like lock yourself down to one light source. 
especially if you're going to reuse the scene. If, if it's if it's like a set and done painting, you can still overlay with lighting and it'll still get some really interesting effects. But if you want that, if you want as much freedom as possible, you're better off not painting hard shadows and more. Mm. And, and it's better if you paint like ambient occlusion on like in the, in the areas, you know, are going to be 100 percent darkest. Mm-hmm. And totally agree. Thing. Like simply said, simply said, you know, the way I think of it is if you paint a cloudy day, then you can have like all the freedom in a 3D tool. Just, like, you know, I do the same kind of thing for redshift renders and stuff where I kind of paint the diffuse um, version of the painting. Right. However, I've done too what Edward said, what, what he has done is like where you have like hard shadows and like um, a harsh light, light source and stuff in Quill. And I painted it like that and I rendered it and it does give you crazy results sometimes where yeah. you cannot do that like uh, in any other way. Right. And then like, for, for example, I don't know if you guys remember my sewer rat piece that I rendered, that one was yeah, completely yeah. lit in quill. So I painted mm-hmm. the light in quill and then rendered a similar lighting setting in redshift. And all of a sudden I was like, "Whoa, this looks crazy because it is a light source, but it's not really because it's painted. Mm-hmm. But it works really well together with like an ambient lighting with um, global illumination and stuff. So I think there's like value in both approaches, but yeah. definitely for freedom, it's good to have like what, what Edward said to just paint an ambient illusion is already a huge plus. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And I might even I have some some other assets sitting around. So I might even show show what like both sides of it when you have it painted awesome. and when you don't have it painted. So I can show that. But yeah, as you can see, so the there's there's the distinction between the lines and the detail, and I'm and I separated the lines because sometimes you want to add like different effects on top of your line art. Because for example, I like a more pencil kind of look, which is why my lines are are not like hard black and they're more blended into the into the surface of the actual geometry. So what I'm what I'm doing is I'm separating them so that way I have freedom and unity to be able to like change the properties of what this what the, these individual strokes look like without affecting the whole model. And then my details, and I think this is this, this part is really important. So these details are they have two functions basically. They they allow you to simulate bounce lighting, but they also mm-hmm. allow you to blend in your shadows, your dynamic shadows with your painting. Because when you basically when you if, if you don't separate your details into a different layer they will cast shadows right and the problem with that is it makes when you when everything casts shadows in your scene it makes everything feel like geometry which is not exactly what you want to go for because this is more textural right this is more like like you this is something you simulate with a, with a normal map and if you're doing traditional 3d modeling so you don't want it to you want it to get, like have some degree of shadow and form but you don't want it to be casting shadows on top of the mesh otherwise it, it breaks the whole illusion of this being one one unified painting so separating that also gives you that freedom to that now and, and you'll see what that actually looks like when i get into unity so that's the main tree and this is this i generally use this approach for like my environments just this three level setup so i can have as much freedom as i want as I want in terms of customizing it afterwards. Because the main thing about my workflow is it's designed from, I have a 2D background. I started out with illustration and comics and things like that. So I, I'm leaning more towards that than hard, harder 3D. That's kind of something you can get using my own on Unreal, right? It's more kind of Pixar-ish, but like I'm going for something more that leans further into the 2D aspect of things and feels more hand done. So I basically also made these Leaf houses are more for decoration than anything else, but they also help as just background kind of noise. They're not animated, but I have I do have two two animated files in here, which are the grass and the flowers. So I'm gonna set my entire timeline is 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 a is on a, is on a second loop or it's two second loop anyway. So it's, it's another thing is it's really important to like I think Gore mentioned this in a previous stream. It's just like trying to make sure your loops are always kind of like. Like they have, they're always the in multiples. Thing. Yeah, that was the same thing. Because like my character, for example, she's on a she's on a two second loop, while the rest of my environment is on a one second loop. So that way, I can still play both without like losing any data and making sure it loops perfectly. So right now, this is what the scene looks like, and there's just very subtle, like there's subtle background stuff going on. You can see this is actually moving just a little bit, but not too much to distract you. And yeah, it's it's good to make sure that they all they all match because you're gonna have to assemble all of your parts again in Unity. So 
the easier, like the better, you know, having everything in, in multiples of one or two helps, like mm -hmm. helps the process so you don't have to like manually figure out how everything works, like re realign everything on a timeline. You can just slap it in and it's all in a match. And this yeah, is all that's good. actually like super yeah. important, right? Because um, it, it removes cognitive load. You don't have to worry about that thing anymore that loops don't match up, you know, because if you're always, if it's always divisible, then you, you know exactly that you, you don't have to worry about the animation. It will always loop correctly. And I think that's like a huge plus if you, like even if you don't export it to Unity, if you're within a quill file, you know, I always recommend, you know, if you have a loop that's like six frames long, then the longer ones will be 12 or 24 or 48 and stuff like that, because then you can also merge them and stuff. And, you know, I, I guess Nick could <laughs> tell you all about it, you know, how important it is to have it like um, divisible and stuff. So not just for exporting, but also within quill, it's recommended to use that workflow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to move over to exporting and show how I do that. It's pretty much, I'm pretty sure it's the same across the board for everything, but I'll just reiterate it just to be sure. So what I usually do is I, I have, I make sure I have a clear distinction between what's animated and what's uh, static because you can easily, anything that's static, you can export all at once. You don't have to worry about, about like uh, make sure, making sure it works. So right now my skybox, I'm going to export that in a separate layer. So I'm going to turn that off and basically right now, these are the only three animated parts of the scene. So I'm going to just, so this, everything here is static. And I mean, I know this much. and they're still on separate layers. And that's really important because they still, you, know, you want as much malleability as possible. So all I'm going to do now is just make sure this is the only thing selected and on hit export and then just call it environment. And the folder structure will be the same in Unity, right? Uh, sort of. I'll, I'll, I'll show that in a sec. Oh, okay. 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 So export meshes, big transforms, linear. I always do. I always do linear. You can use gamma, but I, but linear in most cases is better. The only time I use gamma is whenever I want to bake textures, because then, because then uh, gamma gives you better values for, for baking. But apart from that, linear is pretty much always a go-to. You don't need, for anything that's not uh, anything that's not moving, basically you don't you obviously don't need animation. You don't need UVs either. And depending on what you're doing, you might. But in most cases, I found you don't need it. And material per layer is not necessary either. Because you can, every all of the more precise material adjusting you can do you can do by yourself, like in Unity. You don't actually have to do this material. Material per layer might actually make setting up your objects a little more stressful. So, so I hit export. I'm only going to export uh, two of them because I already have them exported. But like, I'm going to export because like also this one is really heavy. So, so I'm going to just not export it. I already exported ahead of time. But yeah, so that's that, that's that's the process for exporting the scene and for the animations. It's kind of it's basically just the same thing. The only difference is obviously it's animated so just call it flowers loop because i might reuse this asset who knows and then same settings just animations take this time yeah i'm not using them here so it's fine and that's basically everything and, and final question thing, about the yeah. format um uh what do you, how do you feel about fvx versus alembic like, um, uh, right. Yeah. It depends on what yeah. I'm doing. For example, uh, I know Alembic is good for, uh, things like getting things like motion blur or getting, or like tracking, for example, mm. there's some plugins I use that have like dynamic depth of field that adjustments. So whenever I want to mm. track an object through space and make the depth of field change with it, I, I will use Alembic because then it can track better. It can actually mm. track because otherwise if you're using FBX, you have to manually like create a separate game object and yeah. animate it to match. So it tracks. So Alembic saves in that in that in that sense. It's it's it, it comes come, Alembic tends to bring out heavier files, so I I lean away from it because being able to edit everything in real time is such a really good thing. It's, it's a, like in terms of for iteration, it helps a lot. So I lean more right. towards FBX, but Alembic does have its uses, especially if you want to do more like more complex stuff. Because the beauty of Alembic is you can take it into into things like Blender, right? 
and you can adjust. Right. So sometimes like I have, like I have, uh, for example, normals or something are facing the wrong way or I want to smoothen out some geometry, but I've already animated it, right? If you, if you export as yeah. FBX, it's giving you all the frames separately. And that's a lot of work to be able to clean out that geometry. But if you export as a, as a Lembic, it's only you're essentially getting one model because only the vertices are moving. Exactly. So, so exactly. And you know, that's what I like, especially about like if I export animation, because FVX, like I do the Maya workflow, right? And mm -hmm. if I import FVX into Maya, it's like each each frame is like mm -hmm. it's separate geometry versus yeah. a Lembic treated as, as one. And is it similar in Unity, or is there a way to, for example, if you want to change the shader, that it applies it quickly to all the frames? Because in Maya, it takes forever to do that, you know. Oh yeah, and uh, with FBX, it's, it's it's you can apply you can apply it once, but if you want to do it, like basically when you import upon import, you you, exp you apply all the materials, right? But okay. when you're when it's in context, you can still change per frame, basically, which is the one thing I do like about. Uh, FBXs okay. because they're all separate. You can actually change the material per frame. So if you want to do specific effects to that for using that, you can actually do that. So th there's that malleability. But alembics are definitely easier to set up because once you import your alembic and you set it up once, it's it's golden. Yeah. Like you don't have to do yeah. everything. You change about it will automatically update, which is yeah. So yeah, they're cool. very definitely very useful for that. I I, I just yeah, yeah, it's just in terms of file size and also because like for example, characters like her. Because this is a yeah. really complex, heavy, heavy character. I wouldn't use Alembics as much because I know, because I know how heavy this is going to be, and I do, and I, I want to be able to see her playback. Alternatively, what I do is I just sometimes I just optimize the character first. Like I, yeah. like this character, I wouldn't optimize too much because if I if I do, she's a, for example, you, you, yeah, you, you see you how drastically she changes. <laughs> <laughs> so like no. I don't do that too much. But no. if I want to test out a really complex animation first, I'll, I'll optimize it export it play back in unity then i can just like and if you if you know what you're doing with unity you don't even have to like reset up the object you just have to like export and overwrite the file with the new version mm -hmm. and then just snap into place yep. with all your settings that's so cool that, that's the that's kind of the main difference and final thing i'll do before we switch over to unity is i'll make a skybox for a unity compatible skybox so the way to do that is first you need to Turn off everything once again, and then I have a where's my skybox layer uh, somewhere here. Yeah, why is it not showing? Uh, there we go. So I have to turn off all these things. So Unity has uh, sorry, Quill has this function that has honestly saved my life on so many projects because it's you can basically just export a cube map directly from here. And the layout for at least the one I use for Unity is is V-Strip. Because once you do this, and you, you just kind of stand in the center or wherever you want, really. Take your picture, and you have this. This is very useful because normally you have to author, either have to author your skyboxes through 360 images, which is one option, or you can or you can do it, like you have to manually like go into Photoshop and paint each face. But with Quill, you can basically paint whatever skybox gradient or whatever thing you want, actually, no matter how complex, easily, because you're not, you don't actually have to, you're not translating like four sides of an image to a box. It's already automatically done in this. So once you, and this is the perfect format for like d quickly making a skybox in Unity. You, you, like it's, it's like a two step process after you have this. So once I've caught, once I've mm -hmm. saved this to my disk, I can throw this into Unity and reuse it as skyboxes for as long as I want. Basically, pretty much every skybox I've, I've made in the past like year or at least has been made in Quill because of this this function. So it's very useful. The same thing applies for um, uh, 360 images. You can do the same thing with 360 images in Unity where you can paint paint an environment here, throw it in and, and use it as your backdrop. It's, it's kind of the same way you would do it for Quill Theater because Unity is a game engine, so it, it does have a lot of similar optimization tricks. But they're very, these, just basically these th all these tool sets are very useful for a lot of things, especially if you're doing more game dev heavy, heavy stuff. But yeah, that's the final thing I'll, I'll do. And they, right at this point, with everything exported, I have everything we need to take the scene into Unity. So Omari has a question, Edward. She's asking, are you thinking before how you will reuse the assets afterwards? For instance, the tree and flowers, or can you do this after? Uh, you can, you can do things like you can do a lot of these things afterwards. I tend to think before, cause like, especially most of these assets are not particularly new for me. Like I'm, 
I'm uh, I'm always kind of making trying to make the most out of all the LBS I have. For example, this is uh, so I'm going to import this. This these are like assets I already have from mm. somewhere else. So I I tend to just go into because I because I'm a lot of my projects overlap thankfully. So I'm able to just jump in back with that. So I, I do think about like reusability at the time, but I don't, it's not like I try to make each and every single asset like reusable from the ground up. It's more of, okay, this asset looked really nice when I was rendering it. I'm going to go back and like make it work even better. For example, this tree, I might reuse this tree, this main tree here, which is probably why I separated because I did spend a lot of time detailing it. Yeah. So it's, it's just, it's not necessarily like you have to think of it ahead of time. You can just always go back and be like, okay, it seems reusable. And I have a follow-up question to that. So if you reuse this tree, would you um, reuse it in Quill first? So you put it in the layout you want and re-export it? Or do you do the layout then, because you already have the tree as an asset, would you do that in Unity directly? It depends on what I'm using. If, if I'm doing a painting, I would rather yeah. go do it in Quill because Quill has just, just like, there's just a, like I can tell you that making placing 3D assets in Quill is much more so easy right <laughs> exactly and yeah. doing it on a screen like I, I absolutely hate even with like even like with level editing tools because you have tools in unity where you can just like you like a paintbrush paint in assets yeah. on, on your but even then quill is so like precise that i prefer to actually do a lot of these things in quill but if i'm making a video game for example i would mm. isolate each and every single like asset by itself because i know i'm gonna re i'm gonna replicate it right each time and I'm just, just I'm just export it one by one so I could and then pose them in Unity because that's that's generally like using prefabs is generally like a, a Unity workflow. You're, you're supposed to have all these assets isolated so you can reuse and dynamically like it's also better for optimization if like you're not making a, a billion individual unique assets and you're just right. using a couple of instance and stuff. Exactly. Yeah. So that that's it, it really depends on what you're doing, because but for, in most cases with Quill, especially because I mostly do films out of Quill. It's like, I know that I'm, I, I want very precise images. So like, I'm always like, okay, I, I would rather just manually repaint. And also you have, there's a lot of like really like easy ways to like adjust assets for whatever you need. So like, this is one tree, right? This is, and this is, this is why I really like about being able to use stuff like this. This is just one tree asset that I would have to like do, like change things like UVs and stuff like that if I wanted to adjust it. But with Quill, you can just kind of like quickly grab and contort. Totally. Um, you, you, you have another asset, basically. It's, like, really fast to do yeah. a lot of things like this. So, well, yeah, that's, that's basically my, my approach for that kind of thing. And I'll, uh, yeah, what I'll do is I'm going to switch over into Unity now. So when you first open Unity, this is probably what you're going to see. Uh, it depends on the, on, the, on the pipeline you're using. For example, I, and this is, this, this is more behind-the-scenes technical stuff. That is that that I can I can probably go into later. It's not I'm not going to spend too much time on the stream, but I'm using uh, something called the Universal Render Pipeline. It's kind of Unity's main pipeline right now. There's a bunch of they have different uh, strengths for them. For example, this one is the Universal Render Pipeline is mostly used for mobile games and VR projects. But if you want to go something more realistic, you you can end up using the High Definition Render Pipeline, which is for like more AAA looking things. It's closer to what Unreal looks like. But I prefer to use this one because it's, in my experience, it's the most customizable. So this is kind of just the standard Unity scene you'd get when you when you start mm -hmm. this. So I'm, I'm starting here just to kind of give everyone a fresh idea of what it's like. So what I'm going to do is, so this is the folder I, ma I, I made for this stream, and I'm going to pull up my my like my assets that I've exported now. So this is everything. Just for these four assets, environment. Headphones, grass loop, and all that. So what I'm going to do is just drag. That's basically your the library kind of. What? That's kind of like the library of assets over there on the bottom, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's these are all your assets in in Unity. Mm -hmm. So it's sorry, I'm not familiar with Unity. <laughs> no. Oh yeah, no, no, worries. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try. And, I'm gonna keep this pretty simple. While, level. Yeah, and while it's loading, um, KDSH is asking: um, Are pivot points respected when brought into Unity? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> oh. it, it really depends on how you 
how like what you export basically if you export a really complex big model then like if you basically if you if you flatten all your models it will be it'll be very you won't get like a, a decent the 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 pivot point you set in unity won't be in in quill sorry won't be the same but if you have individual items for the most part it should it should like it, it might not always hit the exact point it was when you were working in quill but it will give you a, a kind of satisfying spot if if you have kind of it, it's better for you to have self isolated assets if you want good pivot mm-hmm. points directly in Unity. Like I prefer for this so method it, anyway. So Unity, so it's yeah. Unity basically taking the center of the bounding box, or exactly. it's just taking um, the center of the bounding when box. you import stuff. Yeah. Okay. So that's that. So you just just keep that in mind whenever you're doing because it's ne- never going to be the exact same one as as what in mm. what is in a, what's it called Quill because unless you, yeah. I think the big transforms option has a big like saying in how that actually that actually plots out but in most cases you should be fine especially if you're not like making them as individual assets but if you're making if, if you want to like if you're doing it more for like a film type thing where you just want to render out your shot you should be fine it doesn't it, it won't really matter because you won't have to move stuff at all everything will just kind of snap back into place okay so i have all my assets imported and what i'm going to do is i'm going to make a fresh scene just for this and time check for you, Edward. You're at like half an hour in so far. Okay. No problem. And then, yeah. So these are my assets. And when you first bring it, I'm going to start with the environment. When you first bring it in, this is what it's going to look like. So first thing you, you might notice is that it's tiny. And <laughs> the reason why is because Quill comes in at like a hundredth of the scale that you kind of, you, you made it in basically. So the first thing you need to do is basically make all your assets a hundred times bigger. <laughs> so this, this might take a while because uh, one of them files is really heavy, but you know, it shouldn't take too long. So for people, if you're worried that you can't read the um, words on the screen, the recording will be high definition. So this is just a stream issue. So if you have trouble reading it, in the replay, you will be able to see everything correctly. We have to entertain people while it's loading. <laughs> yeah. Tell us a joke, <laughs> Goro. I, I, I don't know. I'm bad at joke telling. Oh, yeah, me too. Uh, I don't know. Um, sing us a Spanish song. <laughs> oh, there it is. Mambo Leo. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, this is our environment. This is what it looks like without all the, the without basically without any vertex color and what without any, uh, what's it called? Without, with lighting uh, attached on top. So this is, so you can already start lighting, to see. Right? What? It's just default lighting. Yeah, default lighting. So this is, you can already see the yeah. sausage look that, the famed sausage look that everyone who's trying to <laughs> <laughs> render yeah. something in <laughs> Sinkle cool has run into. <laughs> yeah, and this, this was the first thing I had to like tackle when I was trying to figure out how to solve this. So the main solve for this is basically you have to kind of, in my experience, there's two ways to solve this. You either go as far as to re- retopologize the model and bake it as a texture, which is work, or... Alternatively, you can just make a shader that has its own custom lighting built specifically for this. So what I did, so that's something I, I, I did, I, I made the shader, I think so I started making this earlier this year. It's been just slowly putting it together. And so I don't know how familiar you guys are with shaders, but they're just, it's just kind of like, they're just kind of a few lines of code in, in most cases that just tell objects how to receive light. And you can use them to make materials and then apply them to like your objects to make them look different. Now, the beauty of quill objects is that they they all have they're all very like dependent on vertex color, so you don't need to apply textures or anything. It's all kind of in the model's data itself. It won't show initially, but it's already it's still there. So when you make a fresh material in Unity, it will always default to like the there's always a default like sh- material the way it starts. Which is right now it's this universal render pack plane lit. All I need to do to switch it to mine is basically press that and kind of find shader graph. So I made the shader in shader graph, which is like a node based editor for shaders. It's kind of like if you've used Blender before, it's you, you recognize shader graph. It's kind of the same general principle. You're just attaching nodes to each other to make what you want. And this is the one I, I created specifically for Quill. And it has a few settings, shading intensity, shadow color. I'll get into them after I apply it. 
But all I need to do now is drag the shader into these two material slots. And this is why I chose not to do material like uh, layer per material, because if I did that, that means every single object that's in the files here will be separated here. And I'd have to like manually attach this to each and every single one. This way it, it just it just applies to double and sided double and single sided once and you can get the whole thing to change just like that. So now it resembles closer to what we had in Quill. But now you can see it's actually taking in shadows, but there's no sausage look anymore. And it's all still dynamic, so. Because you apply, you, you apply that shader, the, 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 um, the um, customized that you made, right? Exactly, yeah. So it's To just, avoid that kind of sausage. Yeah, because it's, it's something you, the way this one works is just basically, because usually it's using, uh, no, normally it uses like the surface normal data, right, to, to light an object properly. Mm -hmm. But the way this shader works differently is that it's not actually doing that. It's just using the shadow map. Because like the sun is basically like a glorified camera, right? That's the sun. Mm -hmm. So it's just a glorified mm -hmm. camera. So it's like based on what the camera can see, it's casting shadows. It's really as simple as that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, because you're able to do that, it means it's not actually revealing any of the under underlying surface data. It's just adding light on top of it. And That's I can awesome. move the, the, the light up and down and you can see it changes in yeah. real time. Mm. Yeah, and this is closer to what you see if like, so, so there, was a, there was a shader that came out a few years ago, I think. This is what you're seeing right now is the, basically what you'd see if you got that shader, it's kind of, as what I, I started, I researched that one as a base to kind of see how it worked. And this is kind of this, the base effect, but I went on to like add extra control over the lighting for this one. So for example, you, you guys can see all the parameters up here, right? Yeah. Okay. Shading intensity, I, it's good to leave it here. I, I tend to leave it here, but you can adjust how much, like how it, it actually takes in light. So if you want it much harsher light or softer light or much, you can control all these values here. But I tend to leave it here. This is, this is not the lighting properties. This is the shade, the shader property. Yeah, these are the shader properties. The light itself okay, is okay. here, right? And, I, and, and I'll adjust that afterwards. The light the light, right? Yeah, but this is the shader first. And you can also adjust the shadow color, which is something I, I find really useful for me because I have a two because yeah. background. I like very precise shadows. So right now I, I hit this button and it's all black because it was originally set to black. But if I want something similar to like sun, like the sun, right? And the kind of global illumination you bounce light you'd get. Mm -hmm. I could just tweak. So you can make it pretty yeah. much whatever color you want. If you want red shadows for some reason, you can. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. You can change the mood color. really. It's really it's meant to be really simple. And it's, uh, and it's uh, asking if you could show the shader graph, the shader tree. I, I I'll get into that. Yeah, it's 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 really dense. Okay. <laughs> I'll get into that. Yeah, I'll, I'll show that out. Okay. Thanks, thanks for reminding me. And then, yeah, there's a bunch of other things you have here too. There's like rim light. So if you want, it's kind of like a, I don't know any of you have played Breath of the Wild. It's kind of yeah. emulating that kind of effect. So if you wanted that, you can tweak how much it affects it too. And then there's also global illumination, but, but I'll, get, I'll use that, I'll show, show that later. So yeah, this is just, this is just the first step of getting your, your thing set up and you can still tweak some of these values to like get exactly the kind of look you want. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to import the other, the other assets. So these ones take less time because they're, um, sorry, because they're smaller and they're less heavy. They're animations, but there's because they're very simple. There's just grass and flowers. They, they take very little time to actually, um, like apply their, their materials. And once again, because I'm like, everything is still on the origin. So I don't actually need to like position anything again. I can just drag them into the scene and they'll automatically be placed exactly where I painted them in Quill. Mm. So that's the beauty of, of working in Quill is because you already do your asset placements from the, from the get go. So you don't really have to worry about aligning everything. And the camera is kind of in the wrong place. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drag it. This is kind of an occupational hazard. You, I've almost never been able to import my camera exactly where I wanted it at the first go. 
So you just kind of, I'm just going to rotate it here actually. 180 degrees. And yeah, so that's kind of where the camera should be. And yeah, for the, so this is the big one. So when that's, this, this, this is the character now. The character is probably where I think lighting is most important on because I've noticed like you don't have to paint because I painted my, my environment with like singular strokes, right? Just to like make sure maximize for the best type of lighting possible. But you don't actually have to in for most cases in environments, you don't actually have to do that. You're like you're OK, like it's OK, like whatever you paint will still take in lighting the way it should relatively. There, there might be a few bumps and a few awkward kind of like strokes there here and there. But in most cases, it will work exactly as you want. But with characters, that's where I notice the most problems because, like, we know how humans should look because we see, we're human, right? We see each other every day, so we know exactly how a human face should work. So when, like, there even when the lighting is even just a little bit off, it creates this kind of. I don't. It's not a quite on Candy Valley, but it's somewhere. It's just kind of unpleasant. Yeah. You kind of know something is off about how yeah. this face. I looks. mean, to <laughs> What? I like yeah. the preview that it shows everything. <laughs> yeah. It looks like a new face. <laughs> yeah. like, it's like a duck face. <laughs> yeah. And then I can just put There you have a yeah. perfect caricature of the <laughs> So this is what all the characters this is this is basically what it looks like. These are all your phrases before you've done any anything to them. So what I usually do from this point on is so I'm gonna turn off the gizmos real quick is I make a timeline. So I have my timeline open already. And you can always, so you select, there's always an, a master object for your timeline. So I usually use my main camera because, you know, it just makes sense to me. But it doesn't have to be your main camera. It can be anything. You just hit create and I'm just not going to name it because for time. And once you've done that, it opens this up. So the main way you just play back animations in Unity is animation tracks. So it's just, this is an empty track that's to register for an animation. And I'm going to duplicate it uh, three times because we have three animations in this scene. And the trick here is it's really simple. You bit each FBX to export. Actually, each, no matter what animation, whether it's Alembic or FBX, you always have an animation stack. They might be named different things depending on the, on the file, but it's always going to be there. So all you need to do is drag that in. And right now, this is set to about two seconds. I'm going to just adjust the frame rate because right now it's, it always starts at 60. So you have to adjust the frame rate, but I'm going to send it back to 24. But yeah, it always, it's always, it's always going to be two seconds. That's, that's the beauty. So of you said it. before that, um, Alembics, um, so you use FBX because you can play it back in real time. Um, is Alembic slower in general, uh, in uh, processing? In it's, Unity? yeah, it, it takes more. It seems to take more to more processing power to do it, but you can still play it back in real time. Like depending on how complex it is, like this character specifically, yeah. by Aquarius as Alembic, it will be much harder to play back. But okay. it, it probably can, depending on like this. Like, this is a twenty eighty, so it should it, it can play back. A lot. It can handle quite a lot. But like, if you basically, if if I had like a billion, I remember you know in an, one of my first cool scenes I took into Unity, I had like I had like a bunch of grass, like a like really mm -hmm. long blade of grass, and I think this was before we had optimization. <laughs> so so that was that. And then I, I animated each blade of grass manually and cloned and cloned and cloned. And I brought it as a an Alembic. I ended up being like a two gigabyte file. Oh, jeez. <laughs> for about, like, I think maybe 12 frames of animation. And it just would not play. Like every time I hit play, Unity would crash. So it was really bad. Oh, wow. So okay. it really depends on what you're using for. Like small loops and things like the grass will be fine. But it, like these, like even these blades of grass, not every single one of them is actually animated. Only if a couple of them. Oh. Just to kind of yeah, create that. makes sense. So things like that. What I've done here is I've basically thrown in the animation tracks for each each animation respectively. And all you need to do now is you already have your object set up and you have the animations on the timeline. So you just need to drag them into the corresponding slot. So this is the main character. So now that I've done that, you can see her head kind of come back to normal. Hmm. And I can hit play and she's going to, whoa. So you guys see that? <laughs> I'm very glad that yeah. happened because that's this is something that a lot of people have run into with importing Quill. So when you're importing Quill animations, it's important to there's like a there's actually just like a tiny little checkbox that you need to hit. Otherwise, your animations will have this weird effect. So up here under animation, 
resample curves. That's kind of the only thing that's causing this problem. I ran into this for a short for a film I was working on, and we didn't actually realize this was the problem for like I think eighty percent of production. It was really, it was really bad because we we had to like we kept like reanimating stuff because we thought we did it wrong, and we found out towards the end it was one button. So. So this thing right here is a lifesaver. Once you hit that, your animations should come in pretty much exactly as you as you as you animated them in Quill. But, Good that you can do it afterwards. <laughs> yeah, because holy shit! Oh my god! <laughs> so weird. They have... Amari is asking: um, Is this shader quest proof? <laughs> is it quest proof? Uh, that's a good question. I've. The I did this afternoon stroll piece a few weeks back. I was able to put it on the quest. It's on the quest I'm actually using right now. It mm. it runs on the quest, but I haven't I haven't actually like taken the time to optimize the shader. So I don't know. That there's probably underlying things I need to optimize for it to make it run better. But it and when you say run. you put it on the quest, when when you say you put it on a quest, did you create like an app that runs on the quest? Or yeah, I made a quick Unity build with the afternoon stroll scene. Okay. And the lighting, but I left the lighting dynamic, which is the problem. So it, it basically on on the environment, in most environments, if if they're like fairly low poly optimized, they will work, and your your scene will look pretty much exactly as you painted it, and as it looks in Unity. Like with obviously the caveat of like the graphics on the quest, but with characters, I found it's a lot trickier to optimize. So that's mm -hmm. where it's. I, I do know the shader does work on. On Quest, I've been able to run on, run it on Quest, and, it, and it, it, the environment run fine. The character, not so much. So, hmm. I wouldn't say proof yet, but it's compatible. It's definitely compatible. Yeah. So I've set that up, and now I can just drag in all my animations. Sorry, I'm. Unfortunately, I have to keep my headset on because that's where the audio is coming from. So I'm, I'm actually doing this in VR. <laughs> oh, we should have a live stream of. Oh, you you're actually using virtual desktop. I'm, I have to use virtual stuff for this, yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a. Oh wait, you're moving the mouse and everything on with a touch control. In, in VR oh, with a touch yeah. control. Oh, God, that would be that would be a nightmare. Ah. <laughs> oh, so you are still in front of your computer with your keyboard and stuff. I'm in front of my computer in VR. With keyboard, but I'm looking at the, the screen in VR. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Actually, that works really well with the Quest Two because he has this super good resolution. Oh yeah, the, the you can really, resolution. Thing. Yeah, it's I've been I've been doing that with like the mouse and keyboard, and then the Quest Two on top, and then you see your virtual desktop, and it works really well. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's really awesome. Yeah, that's cool, man. But you can see, yeah, so the grass is moving, everything's kind of. And now we can start like playing around with what we want for our lighting and. And you set up your Unity scene at twenty four frames per second, right? Yes, it's. I don't. I, I prefer to have it at uh, just the same yeah, thing I animated it, just for yeah. control. And I'll just. Move there's the no way that Unity can eventually. There's no way that Unity can kind of interpolate uh, between frames, right? Uh there might be. I think. I think it's certainly possible with Alembics. If you're oh, using okay. Alembics, mm -hmm. you. I think there is some some way to do it. I've done it myself, but I think there is a way to interpolate. Alembic. No, somebody confirmed it. Uh, Louis says, uh, yes, the Alembic can, can uh, interpolate between frames. That's Perfect, cool. yeah. So I, I think it is. I, I've, I've taken an Alembics and they do have their, like, I'm, I'm hoping to find a way to blend them. Even that would be amazing if you could blend Alembics together, kind of like the way you do with traditional files. But mm. it's, but yeah, you can, you can definitely, I think you can definitely in interpolate them and make them much smoother if you, if you wanted to. Yeah, because all of this, uh, the Unity stuff, uh, is mostly for 2D output, right? To to render uh, to the video, to the image, uh, not so much for for a VR real time experience, right? Uh, yeah, I think it depends on how you use it. Because like I've 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 made about three. I think I think the, I made the fourth one this this year. I've made about four experiences using Quill assets in VR that they run pretty well. Yeah, only, oh, awesome. only two of them had like full fledged animations. To get one of them, one of them was two of them were like more comic like, but mm -hmm, you can mm -hmm. actually, if you know what you're doing in terms of like just how game dev and optimization, you can actually use Quill. It's 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 certainly possible. It's it's a little tricky because you have to know exactly how Quill works to be able to, to use it efficiently. Yeah. But you definitely can use it for real time. 
I actually have some game dev, like some like third like third person builds on this computer actually where i've used quill oh. models entirely you have your, your oh, characters are running around and everything, things like that so it's, it's definitely possible and i know uh, is there any way we can see any of that stuff uh is there... if there's time <laughs> I'll, I'll see if i can find one of them oh i would love to see that in vr no it's it's, it's, is... it's, it's some of them are yeah it's 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 definitely possible it's 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 hard but like it's possible <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Daniel, I, I don't know if you've seen, but also in this community, someone posted um, a game with like VR game with cool assets, I think a while back. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think I've seen yeah. it, yeah. yeah. Right, that's amazing. So that would be the same thing, right? Like I, either you gamify it or you just do an experience, but it would be the similar workflow. Yeah. It's basically, it's basically exactly how it is. It's because you can use the assets however you like, really. It's just I, I I use them mostly for film because film is when you're working in VR. It's, I think I find it so easy to make 2D film really quickly because you're already there in 3D space. So it's like you can make 2D output very easily. So I tend to just lean mm. towards that. But yeah, here's oh here's another thing I wanted to point out. So the reason why I, I made sure the layers were separate was because of things like this. So you can see there's a there's a few like awkward like some of the strokes are kind of they they feel a bit more like how do I put it. They, they, they're interfering with the lighting a little bit here, the flat strokes. It's, it's a subtle, it's something I've kind of come to notice over time. But like, yeah, these are all the flat strokes, right? So if I turn them off, you, you'll see how they're interfering with the lighting. And I, I want them to kind of blend in. I want them to kind of feel like, I don't want them to feel like there's something separate from the lighting. I want them to feel like they're part of it. So like what I do is here, Unity has, you can have, you have very precise control of, of, over lighting per object. So you can turn off the cast shadows for them and when you do that it allows them to blend in better as part of the light oh i see so you can actually make this composite of of like see can can you see how they're revealing them themselves now you can make like a composite of like paint strokes and dynamic lighting all in one so there's little effects like that and then there's also things like this and this is a more complex thing but like for example the lines i told you i wanted to get this more painterly sorry pencil kind of look to it. So what I can do is I'm going to duplicate the line and I have a different shader that kind of creates that effect. So like it's chiseled edge or something. Yeah. It's I mean, sorry, I have to be hard to see on the stream probably. So I, I, I have this distortion in. effect. So when I do that it okay it's probably not showing as well as the camera is not close enough. It's a camera driven thing. So it should should be adjusting the so you can adjust how it's not trying out. I can't tell because I'm in VR. <laughs> I'm using yeah, the last yeah, one. So like really we blurry. have a really accelerated stream anyway, so okay, we'll, we'll see it in the video. Yeah, I guess we're we're both yeah. even, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it should there's this basically there's there's just a bunch of like smaller very interesting effects you can you can achieve using a bunch of shaders to like get get these yeah yeah let's leave that for now but another thing i like to do is so this this is there's a more there's more complex lighting effects you can have like for example i'm going to turn on fog right so i can i'm going to sample and just pick the sky or something then i can ramp up the fog as much as i want here too <laughs> to create more cinematic nice. looking effects so i'm gonna just go uh 0.02 it's usually good yeah it's pretty good for now but what i also like to do so this is just unity's built-in dynamic fog right but what i can also do is i have like a separate like because sometimes you want more precise this is because this is just vault, like calculated based on like location and space but you want more precise effects sometimes because what I've noticed about just like learning about how like making things cinematic is, is it's not necessarily that you're going for realism. You're just going for like something that looks good by itself, not necessarily exactly realistic. So what I'd like to do, I made this, it's another custom shader that's like specifically to simulate fog, but like localized. So oh, this plane, I can basically move and scale and adjust whatever because it's not really the fog it's just like a plane that fakes it so i can move it wherever i want and it creates this kind of effect 
of like fog. <laughs> so I can single out the character even more. I'm thinking I want to adjust that FOV because I'm trying to get that. I'm trying to get this foreground tree in place. So maybe something like this. And sometimes you want to like, there's some things that are hard to, to figure out with dynamic lighting. So like sometimes you can just cheat it. For example, I want this, this tree right here to be in shadow, right? So, and I can't like, I don't have mesh to do that. So I can just create a cube and place it. Cast the shadow. Cast the shadow. Right. <laughs> and then you can turn it, you can, maybe, you can basically set objects to only cast shadows and not actually receive any like form or light. So there's just a floating invisible cube here that's casting the shadow perfectly for this shot. And Love it. Yeah. I found there's just a lot of like tiny little straightforward hacks like, like to do things like this because you don't have like you just don't you just don't have time to like actually go back into quill and like you manually make a tree to get that shadow effect mm -hmm. so that looks like so this is kind of getting closer and closer to to like a more finished piece i'm going to just throw in something also so there's you can also add post processing so you can do everything from color grading you know bloom all of those effects if you wanted i made i made a, a profile ahead of time so we can to get an idea of what that looks like. So when I hit post processing, you get a, you can get more precise effects. So this is kind of closer to what I initially imagined for the scene. We're starting to get there, but this isn't really like this. This is just what the stream kind of. This is what I'm showing. This is just me putting together. So you can kind of get an idea of how I would actually put a scene together. But what the actual scene will look like. Let me save the scene. Uh, sorry. I, I, we hear I, I, your I, baby, Daniel. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry, let me just save this as stream. File organization is everything. And just time it. check, Edward, you're at the hour, but um, of course we can go over. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to switch over to the actual scene. So this is what the final, I made it ahead of time just because I knew I wasn't going to be able to make it. Uh, um. I love that caricature face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, this is kind of what it came out as. What you're seeing right here, I'm gonna. Uh, I have to make sure my. I have a bunch of plugins for rendering, so I'm gonna make sure they're off, so I don't hit hit play and it starts rendering. <laughs> I'll be really. Bad. <laughs> but yeah, this is closer to what it actually should look like, and it's finally done. Ignoring this. And there's things like uh, like depth of field and effects like that that don't show up here right now because because I'm not I'm not actually rendering it, but yeah. this is where's oh god where's where where to go? Come on! Oh, so this tiny little window. Thing. There we go. That's uh, where are you? Post process component. This, this part's rather complex, but you can get all these. This smear frame. Oh my god! <laughs> you can you can use other like because Unity is basically, I would I would I, like it's 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 not something that from the box you can get every specific thing you're trying to get you want to do. So you might have to rely on like plugins and things outside of the core Unity project, especially if you're using something like Quill, which is kind of very niche in terms of the larger rendering world. But you can achieve a lot of really interesting effects if you have the right a sort of like arrangement of things. Because there's like, I think this this is actually the best so far, as far as I know on Unity, this is the best depth of field you can get. This is actually better than Unity's built-in depth of field. This is a Deckard render by a really talented developer who does a lot of film work. And it's it's pretty real. You have like so much control over how how much like like yeah you can control the aperture you know focal length all that stuff and you can even actually if you had if i had a moving object here i could actually track it so that the depth of field oh, okay that did not that's not what i meant to tweak <laughs> so this is um this is not for real time this is more for rendering right this is more for rendering in real time you basically yeah, okay. get like but in real time, what you're gonna get is this is this is real time. So this is based what it looks like yeah. in real time. Right. right now, you can yeah. add depth of field and stuff like that. But for VR, obviously you don't use depth of field for VR. But yeah, you, you don't want to. Yeah, you want to do that. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to do that. But like, 
if I were to plop in a VR headset right now, what you're seeing here is pretty much exactly what you'd be seeing in right in, in VR. It's it, it and you and this is the same. This goes this goes like applies the same thing for game for like games or whatever you really want to make out of this. You can use it. I think you can even do put stuff like this in AR too if you if you, if you wanted to. So there's kind of a what I like about this kind of workflow is it's a one. It's like you make it once and you can kind of apply it anywhere. There's there's just a there's a wide number of of ways you can apply any of your quill assets directly into 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 a game Unity engine. You can basically start hit the ball running and make whatever you want. As long as the important thing is just knowing. I think optimization is always the hardest part when it comes to quill because you're yeah. always gonna want be worrying about poly counts and things like that. So finding ways to to be like figuring out. Sometimes you don't need to make everything in quill. There's there's certain things that will probably be more performant if you don't make them in like grass, for example, right? Because mm. in most cases, you won't actually use mesh for grass. You'd use like cards and just insta them across the entire scene. So there's things like that you'd, you'd want to consider if you're doing more game related things. But I would say for film, you can basically do, you know, that's one thing I like about film is you don't have to worry about optimization at all. You can just kind of make to your heart's content and render it out because it's all going to be a video at the end of the day. Yeah. yeah. Louis Hong is asking if you're going to use the Skybox, if you can show how you right. use the Skybox sorry. that I, I you exported earlier. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I skipped over that. Thanks for reminding me. Uh, yeah. So I'll show, you, I'll show you how that's up. You might, uh, might want to turn off the render window. Thank you. God, okay, this, I'm going to move this thing back because it's so close to my face in VR <laughs> that, I'm, that I, 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 I only <laughs> see like a quarter of the screen at any given time. There we go. That <laughs> seems to be better. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I'm going to jump back into this scene. Uh, just don't say because I might still want to use it. Yeah, so the way you do the skybox is... So all you need to do is make uh, another material. And then I'm not, I'm not even going to name it because no point right now. But then Unity already has like a specific set of materials. This is this isn't custom or anything. This one is built in. Like the only, only the only ones that are the only shaders that are like I showed here that aren't built in are the quill shader and the fog one. Those two are the ones I made myself. But like based on like you, research and stuff like that. But like it, the rest is all built in. So this you just need to pick a cube map, and it already has everything. All you need to do is drop in the image you you set. And I've already imported the image, so all I need to find yeah. So it's called Clear Sky. Basically, once you have that, you can just kind of grab your material and slap it up. And now you have your skybox. Done. It's really that simple. And I can even, so what I'm going to do is take out the plane just so we can go back to what the regular fog looks like. And what I can do is I can actually bake the skybox as part of the, the scene. So, so we have some degree of global illumination going. I can show what that looks like. So you have to you have to do some degree of baking. So I'm just gonna quickly bake some real quick. This isn't like full nudie baking. You can actually get much more interesting lighting effects if you if you rely on that, on bake lighting a lot more. But I'm not using it here for this case because it, it just baking lighting always takes time. So well, now that I've done that, basically the skybox along with the directional light have been kind of registered as as part of baked baked global illumination. So on the shader itself, I can actually activate that now. So this is the cool shader and there's this button to use gi so once i've done that you can see i haven't tweaked it or anything but now it's everything's automatically what i've noticed about global illumination is it, it makes it kind of reveals a 3dness of the of the of the geometry he makes it it makes the strokes more obvious if that's what you want i don't know if that's what you want but you can create like it helps it's, it's very useful in many cases things like bounce lighting for example i might want like the green on the floor to like reflect onto the character's skin. If I were to bake part of the grass into the lighting, it would start reflecting on the character's skin and things like that. So there's a bunch of like really unique effects you can you can achieve using bake using bake lighting. There's just a bunch of like, Okay, it, the list kind of goes on and depending on what you're actually trying to do with with all of this. There's just I think it's it's, it's pretty endless at, at a certain point. Like you can tweak because right now this is this is me referencing the skybox right but i can change this to a gradient 
So if I change this to, let me pick something like a drastic change in color palettes, like, uh, let's try. Oh, yeah, now I can, now I can see it much Yeah, more. now you can see some of the, yeah, now you can see it a lot more clearly. So there's a bunch more, so you can kind of see the different effects you can do all with just one shader even. Like, you don't even need to. And that's like another. There's like a, this is pretty much a different style already, you know. So it's like there's a yeah. bunch of really different things you can achieve depending on what you're going for. I lean away from it because I prefer the more I, I like my things looking a bit more 2D. But this is certainly viable, and it all, like I said, all real time, all still animates. Yeah. yeah. Elitza it is asking again for the shader tree. <laughs> oh, right. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> let's let's open up the floodgates. Of the <laughs> I'm going to hit save before I open it because it's really complex. Uh, we see shaders here. Okay, so you're using shader graph and you double click your shader. It should open this up. I'm going to pull it out so you guys can see. Yeah, so this is the shader tree. This is basically everything that makes this whole thing run. There's a bunch of custom, so it's not just like, not everything that's being used here is built in. So some of these you have are custom, custom nodes. For example, this main light thing is not built in. This is specifically code you have to get for, for like custom, for custom lighting lighting modes, so you have to write some of this yourself. Uh, this is rim light. All of this is just calculating the rim light for you. And then there's global illumination, and then it all feeds back into the PPR master here, which is basically what allows, because this is actually using a physically based light model. If I were to adjust the, the metallic smoothness values, you would actually start to notice the sausage look a lot more, but basically it's hidden by the, the parameters that are all set here. So you can, you can basically customize this to do whatever you want. I have not, I'm even currently working on a version of the same shader that works with textures, so I can jump in and out between quill objects and and baked quill objects. So that way I can like, you know, play around with the same look but on different different ways of working. So yeah, this is basically just the the shader graph. It's probably not optimized, but yeah, it, it works for the most part. I'm still a, a bit like still a bit of a ways before it's fully production ready. There's still some kinks I have to work out. For example, uh, I can show you how it, it works with spotlights, but it doesn't work with point lights in that sense. So how I put it right now, point lights, if I were to bring in a point light, it, it doesn't cast shadows. Basically the point light won't give you any shadows for, sorry. So you can see it doesn't, the point light doesn't really reveal like any direction in terms of where the light is coming from. It just kind of adds a, a softer highlight on top of it, which I find can actually be really useful. But that's something that you can't really have with this with quill objects without revealing the sausage look too much. So it's something I, so, so this is kind of one of the limitations of the shader. And another one would be using spotlights. So right now spotlights work, but to a certain degree, they tend to overlap on top of, uh, so like the problem is in real life, your your shadows will kind of, your lighting would kind of interact with itself. So a br like a more intense light would kind of overtake a less intense light, things like that. But you don't have that with the spotlights. They kind of just jump on top of each other. So it can, it can start to reveal some of the, like mis some of the like fake simulated parts of the light if you don't use it carefully enough. So there are limitations to it, but yeah, so far I think there's a lot of, like there's there's a lot of potential in, in, in this kind of workflow because you can use for anything from previous to finished, like fully finished paint, paintings or animations. So yeah, that's uh, this is basically my, the Quill to Unity workflow that I'm experimenting with right now. Yeah, there's a few more questions. Um, not sure what Louis Song means by that. Um, ideas for transparency implementation in Unity. Oh right, uh, yeah. Transparency is I've I've already done. I don't have the shader right here, but I, in a version, a previous version of this, I had transparency in. I, I I ended up removing it 
just for just for like simplicity but yeah so transparency is doable it's just the, you already have an alpha channel here there's there's like two nodes you add to it uh, I, forget, I forget the nodes exactly but you can you can either do the dither transparency that quill uses or you can just do regular transparency it's it's, it's possible it's doable all within shader graph and all that i can I can probably answer cool. i could probably send notes of how that works later yeah there, he has a bunch of questions actually the next question is have you encountered uh, when quill alembics files are imported into unity does not import normals uh have you encountered that it's a good question i'm not honestly too sure because I've, I've only i've never really used because i know unity recalculates normals for you so i've been able to so I haven't, I haven't really had a problem much because I'm using the Quill direct the, the mesh directly from Quill with Vertex Color. So I don't I don't actually know, but I, I know there are I have been I had some issues like that with with uh, certain imports depending on the settings I've used. It's in most cases okay. the normals are fine, like it's 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 usable, mm -hmm. but it's they're, they're not perfect, but they're usable. But sometimes I, I would suggest maybe going through Blender first. You might be able to. Because Blender, Blender is really good at cleaning up or or, or, or recalculating normals for you. So, so you can, when you export, you import them into into Unity. They're a lot better. Okay. He's asking, have you encountered when the ribbon brush is imported into Unity that it comes with a seam in the normal of the brush? No, <laughs> that's a, that's a new one for me. Uh, if you have any pictures, could you send them in the chat later? I'd I'd love to see what you like what you're talking about. I haven't. I wait, when you say a seam, do you mean like, like? Because I, I know in certain cases the the, the ribbon. I have to open this one. Real quick, Louis Hong, if you want to actually ask the question yourself. Hi. Um, yeah, I sent pictures in a chat. Okay, I will um, if you could. try to look at them from. So the it arc. seems some of the br yeah. So it seems some of the brushes are are a surface wrapped around. But where the surface, um, that where the edges meet, they don't merge the vertices. So, the normals of the um, the duplicate vertices end up pointing towards different directions and creates a, a seam in the normal. Oh, I see. I see. I see. I see. Yes, that's. Yeah, I know what you mean. That's something I haven't quite been able to. To fix it's. I, I tend to just that, that, that's kind of main reason why I, I I lean towards just using simpler like single single pr primitives instead of the lathe technique for like lighting because yeah there's a lot of like tiny little issues like that I've run into like I think I'm I'm hoping maybe like I, I know uh what's his name Joe Daniels is working on uh he's working on a plugin in Blender I think that helps recalculate normals in a more holistic way. So I'm kind of holding up for that to fix, to help fix these things. As far as I, cause that's, that's the, that's the most, in terms of all my research, that's the most, I've, that's the closest I've seen to be able to fixing a lot of problems like this. But yeah, I, 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 I've encountered this problem and it's not something I've quite been able to fix. Like I've had this issue with my character's eyes, which is kind of why this character doesn't have eyes yet, because I'm still trying to figure out the best way to, to, to implement them. When I put my, whenever I use the ribbon brush for eyes, they tend, it tends to give me this problem. For example, I had mm. to, the rim light, it actually, the logic of the rim light here actually, uh, it actually ignores anything that's not front facing because of that problem. So like, you'll notice that the rim light doesn't, um, like you can see, you can see it clearly here. You can see it in most cases, but like when it comes to more flat strokes, you barely notice anything because I've noticed if you, the ribbon brush in general has like issues with if, if you're relying on its normal data it's 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 basically just not very reliable for normal data I tend to use it primarily for details more than anything else because of that so I think maybe like I don't know how, I don't know how to solve this problem I'm hoping Joe Daniels plugin might be a good solution to it because he seems to have solved a lot of these problems by reconstructing his normals entirely I don't know if you answered this question already, but he's also asking, how does the exported brush UV in Quill work? Um, that's a good question. I, I have, I'm still kind of wrapping my head around it, but I use it. I, I was able to use it in a previous film where I uh, where I could 
basically map for example i had a i had a character who was holding like a uh poster in their hand for and he's running around but the problem is because he's a he's he was made in quill he doesn't have any transforms right because it's an fex there's no transforms so what i was able to do is i forget exactly how how i did because it, it was a while ago but you can i think if you export it as an alembic with uvs you can do it in a way because and, and as long as you're using the exact same what's it called mesh from start to finish you should be able to like map some degree of like because like basically if you, if you took a plane for example in unity and uh let me see if i can demonstrate if you took a plane in, in unity or even a cube actually the average object can basically just map textures by itself because of because because they're already uv'd right there is nothing precise it's just general tiling which you can still adjust in unity but like yeah, I can, I can I can still adjust the tiling and all that stuff. So basically, I think this is kind of how it works, especially with the Lembics. As long as you're using the same mesh for the whole animation from from start to finish, you should have like you should be able to tile like textures and things like that on top of the Lembic animation, and it should stay stay in the same relative position from start to finish. I think that's generally what it's supposed to be there for, and how it how it works. That's at least to the mo that's the most I've ever been able to use it for. But yeah, that's that's the most I've, I've seen because I with FBXs it's not really unless you're using a, I think actually honestly it's not really all that useful outside of for alembics because sometimes you let's say you want to do like a sort of like a water type simulation or something with an alembic file and you want your water to have like a certain texture like a lava thing or something that's where the UVs would come in because you can add that lava effect scrolling across the across the object without it losing. Without, without it being random because normally if you bring in a core cool model you can't easily apply like a material like i'm gonna try i'm gonna demonstrate with this this is the same material here the same paintbrush mat but like when i when i apply it onto this onto this tree it doesn't like it doesn't quite look the same as what you're seeing on the cube because there's no uvs on it so that's basically what they do they just help like get better mapping of automatic mapping of textures onto onto your geometry. Hmm. Last That's question from Luis is where do you see the future of Quill as a game development pipeline going? Where where is your personal research going towards? What are the current unsolved challenges? <sighs> Loaded question. Uh, <laughs> That's a pretty deep question. <laughs> Okay, uh, where do I see it going? I see it, like, I mean, like, I, I forget the name of the game, but the one that was posted in the first-person VR adventure, I see that. Those are, those are really good examples of of where it can go. I see it holding up easier in non-VR. Because VR is really hard to optimize for, especially on Quest. So, like, I see it going further into that. Because, I mean, I know Nick, I don't, Nick, I don't know if Nick is still here, but Nick's made, I think, a couple of games in, in with Quill already. And yeah, he's not here, but um, he did it in the game jams right yeah, over a weekend and stuff. Exactly, he did. Yeah. He did with the game. Jam. I think he did another one with his brother. And it is like they even they even released the tools that they used to make it. I, I and they're very useful for that. So because Quill models are easier to run like on like anything that's basically not not like a VR because VR renders everything twice, so it's, it makes things harder. But like in in cases like uh like but if you're just doing on, on a pc or on a screen you only have to render everything once so you don't really have to worry too much about poly counts so i think you can actually do like i think vr you see you see the quill being used for game dev in terms of like i think i think you, you might see it in terms of like stylized looking things because looks like this are harder to achieve with regular modeling but with quill you can get this very precise hand drawn and also people are moving back towards stylized kind of games now, especially indie games. So I'm, I'm, I'm seeing, I'm expecting at least once VR and Quill becomes more commonly used, people will start making games out of it. The main hurdle is like, oh, sorry, my research at least for leans more towards like narrative things. I'm less about like, I, my, my, my specialty is in like, I'm not a, I'm not an amazing program or anything. So like, I'd rather not spend my time on systems, heavy things. I like more narrative things. I'm actually kind of currently writing, writing like a, a project where it's like it's like a narrative thing but you kind of it's kind of like a self-driven exploration narrative thing so there's stories happening around the world and you're able to like run around and find them and they all connect using kind of like an interlocking timeline system things like that and i'm using quill for that primarily because if i were to make it the traditional way I, it would mean that every single character i'd have to like you know model texture 
rig, animate, all that stuff. That's a lot of work. But with Quill, with a, if, if I know what I'm doing, I can just basically make them all. Because like this character is essentially the, the the setup I used for her is is like I think Angora you demonstrated this in your in in the I think the action piece you just did where you could, you're able to swap out the geometry with a new with like a more an embrush version. Totally. Yeah, yeah I'm yeah. using that same system here, so I can actually swap her out with a new character like i still have to adjust like some of the pers- the proportions a little bit but i can actually swap her out with a new character on the fly it's not too hard to like adjust to make a new character so it's so much easier to create fully dynamic characters i even have like some of my characters actually have full-on face rigs that are separate from their faces so what i can do is if i rig the cool character after after the fact and i have an animation that is stock animation i have like their face separate so i can actually animate their faces in unity because i already have like a stock yeah. Like it's kind of like what Leica does with their stop motion faces. They have all the expressions pre-made and then they just swap them out as they're animating. It's kind of like that. You can do that with Unity too if you if you just make it a beforehand. So I think you'll see a lot of, I think over time we're going to see a lot more people you leverage the, the speed at which you can make games with Quill either as prototypes or as full-on games because it is harder to optimize. But you, you for at least for prototyping, because I, I worked on a project earlier this year and we did the entire, we prototyped like, almost the entire thing in quill we didn't even we we ended up actually not even like only like a third of the assets were actually like hand modeled and textured and everything else was quill so it's yeah i think i think one of the most important things is also is so hard to simulate uh in uh, games or even in maya and stuff like that is the traditional like hand-drawn look we always talk about a hand-drawn look yeah. But the advantage of using quill is it is actually hand-drawn so there's no simulation needed right like you just draw it and then basically then you have the maximum visual like creative expression preserved um that you so desperately tried to simulate with traditional approaches and i think that's like you know super attractive for game developers and indie game developers to you know create this unique look that um basically looks different from anything you've seen before right yeah i, I really, um, I really think there's so. a follow-up yeah, there's a follow-up game question um, by Jordi. He's asking, um, um, seems like you worked a bunch on VR-created films. Do you have some games you can list off? And uh, are games a big focus of you as well as the films? Uh, okay, I let's see. I have made, like, in terms of what I've worked on, I've worked on a, I, everything I've mostly worked on VR-related anyway has been, either has been either a film or like a somewhere like you know, there's these ex- VR experiences that are that you can't you can't like exactly say is a game or say is a film either that that's mostly the the area I work because it's much harder to like especially with Quill it's much harder to have more dynamic things going on for example with Quill you can't easily like if I wanted to make this character like for example you have no IKs with Quill so like if you have a character walking down the street you can't make them bend with the geometry so there's things like that so I so the kind of work I do leans away from any games that are or any kind of interactive elements that are too like systemic. So for me, I tend to sit in that in the middle of film and game in that sense. So I, I prefer to make films because they're 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 the easiest and fastest thing to make in terms of just I want to I want to tell a story or I want to do something I can easily just turn out a film with using Quill. But whenever I want to do games, it's more. It's, it's at least still leans into that storytelling angle of things. It's closer to things like Journey, where you're, there's walk, like walking simulator and stuff like that, where you're more. You're, it's less about like you know fighting things or playing things. It's more about just telling a compelling story using interactive like mediums to like help elevate that. I, that's where I lean towards. I am working on a game, like a third person game, but right now, but I'm it's it's VR. It's pretty much entirely VR created, but it's not v, it's not a VR game specifically. The way I'm doing that is I'm going a little, a little bit further than what I'm doing here in, in that I'm using some elements from code, but I'm also like, like I would make, for example, this tree, I would, after I make this tree, I would like retopo it, model it, texture it, bake all that stuff. And I find you can actually use code for those kind of production stuff too, if, if you, if you have the right workflow. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I try to sit on that fence because I find that's where like finding, making that area a lot more accessible to people in a way that you can easily just pick up Quill and pick up like a, a pre-made project in Unity and you can make a game or a film. You can decide what you want to make halfway through if you like. 
I think the more we can get more of those things, the better, because it opens up game development to a lot of people that don't necessarily want to do it. Because I, I really hate programming. Like programming is not, it's not my thing at all. <laughs> <laughs> but like I, I, but I know enough to like create a, like if I wanted to have a story where, you know, there's like she's sitting here, right? And I could have another character like fetching water over here and i can make a story where a game experience where like these two are doing their own thing they're kind of looping doing their own stories but once the system has registered that the player has seen both of these characters like a third story can come out where they meet and they, they interact or something there's little tiny little things like that i think if if like you can if at least there's way if there's enough like systems and things in place that, that makes those things very easy to approach everyone can kind of like easily make their games and or make their stories without having needing to need like a big team because that's what i like about vr and quill is you don't need a huge team to do what you're doing you can do most of what you want to do alone in like a couple of hours versus doing it with like months of five different people doing five layers of jobs so for me at least personally i lean in that area of in those kind of small two-hour indie games that people can make in a short amount of time and just share and that's why I really like about co cool theater is like you can make these kind of experiences just like in a few hours or so and ship them off and anyone else can try them. It's like I, I really like that kind of economy of stories just floating around or around the platform. And that's something I just really want to I so I want to push for and like build off of with, the, with tools like this cool shader and things like that. So. Those were very wise and amazing final words, Edward. <laughs> that was really good. I think you got through everything you wanted to cover, right? We had like one hour and a half an hour mark. Yeah, I think yeah, that's pretty much everything I had to share. I'll uh, the other. Uh, I'll probably share some of the other game stuff after this when this is all over. Yeah, but... you, you can just answer, keep answering in the text chat, and. Um, we can wrap yeah. up the stream. Uh, thank you so much, Edward. This was an amazing, super educational stream. Thank you all for coming. I'll see you all next week. Thank you. Thanks, Edward. Mm -hmm.